Good morning, church family. We would like to welcome each of you to church today. If you are visiting with us, we would also hope you feel welcome and blessed. We would also like to welcome back Pastor Mateo. We have a question for each of you. What was the first thing that you thought of when you woke up this morning? Was it noticing the rain? Was it breakfast? Was it putting on the heater? Or was it connecting with God? David says in Psalms 5.3, In the morning, O Lord, hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. What are your requests this morning? Before we start today, let's just take a moment now and give them to God. God has promised um, just a beautiful exchange when we give our requests to him or our worries to him. He promises to give us peace. It's a beautiful gift that we are given. The last part of Psalms 5 verse 3 says to wait in expectation. So as we wait with great expectation this morning to connect with God, we pray that you guys can relax um, to just be able to experience his goodness this morning and to feel welcomed, um, and to have a happy Sabbath. Good morning and welcome to the Worship in Song section of our Sabbath school. Our first song, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, the author of these words, of this hymn, stood up for what he believed in, and as we traverse this world and its trials, we can be reassured that when we walk with our Lord, we can have peace knowing that God is by our side always. is a a life guide to us to stay in step with our Saviour. It is he who supplies our needs. He gives us rest, strength, guidance, comfort and protection. 
and most importantly, a heavenly home. We have much to be thankful for. Thank you, singers, for that beautiful rendition of the Lord's Psalm. And what a thrill it is this morning to be invited by that eternal Good Shepherd to come boldly, confidently into his house and, and find grace and mercy. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious and loving Lord, how good you are how kind, how patient. We come thankful this morning for the way that you have led us all our lives long. And you know the valleys through which we've passed. You know the valleys that you've shepherded us through. Lord, forgive us where we've doubted. Forgive us where we may have become discouraged and disheartened. But just help us to take a fresh look at our loving shepherd standing there with his rod of authority in one hand and his staff of comfort and help in the other. We do so thank you that we can gather together in worship this morning and sit at your feet. We pray that you will bless the one who leads us in the, in the lesson this morning, touch his own lips with words from on high to lead us to a better understanding, a closer walk with you, our God. We think of those who are not well, who cannot be with us today. You know them by name and circumstance. And we humbly ask that you will give them the assurance that around them and underneath them are the everlasting arms, leading them, carrying them on the way to the kingdom. 
Lord, we think of fellow believers and we think of folk in war-torn countries, in famine-ravaged countries, in natural disasters. Lord, this old world doesn't have much to offer, but you do, and we thank you for the prospect of dwelling in your house throughout eternity. Thank you for your amazing sacrifice, your amazing gift to us, that you, that your Father reconciled the world to himself through you and now has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation, as if God were pleading through us, be reconciled to God. Just lay that on our heart and give us a fresh vision of mission today as we study together and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. My name's Daniel. I used to go to this church maybe 10 years ago. So uh, back for a little bit of study and I've been asked to share the mission spotlight today. I was told to share whatever I wanted. So I've uh, got a little mini, well, probably about four or five little very, very short stories for you, okay? So it's true that sometimes we pay attention to the mission afar off but we don't pay attention to the mission at our door. Is that right? And uh, in Ruth chapter 1 verse 8 it says, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each to her mother's house the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. This idea of a blessing upon these ladies that says the Lord deal kindly with you. And I really believe that God has dealt kindly with us and that means we ought to deal kindly with others. I um, don't know if you're aware, but every Sabbath day in Adventist churches all around Australia, the Holy Spirit moves on the hearts of people who perhaps have never been to church, perhaps haven't been to church in many, many years, Perhaps uh, they have dropped off for some reason, but he moves upon their hearts. They get up, they iron a shirt, and they come and attend a Seventh-day Adventist church for worship. That is a tremendous mission field, isn't it? And I wonder how responsible we are with the solemn privilege that it is that he's entrusted those souls to our hands. I, uh, a friend of mine named Paul, uh, he in the, was involved in the hippie movement uh, in the 60s, and uh, he had very long hair, and uh, a beard, and he came along to our church uh, up north, and uh, I met him and had to do with him. We started meeting together, and uh, he started attending our church from week to week. And uh, one day, somebody uh, was trying to talk to him, and he didn't hear because he has a, has a hearing problem, and they said to him, why don't you just turn up your hearing aid? And he got very offended because he's very sensitive about his, uh, his hearing issue, and he never came back. You know, that's sad, isn't it? But it's not always like that. Um, I, uh, I had another friend whose name was Tilla and she started coming to another one of our churches up north. Um, she was uh, not uh, neurotypical, if you know what I'm talking about, and uh, she had a lot of challenges with her upbringing and also uh, with, uh, with her children as well. Child protection was involved with her family and, uh, and she was uh, very disadvantaged. And, but she was coming regularly to our church and you know what? The members were beautiful to her, absolutely beautiful. And after a period of a couple of years, she decided that she had to move away and, uh, you know, that was her circumstances, so she moved. But she wanted to say thank you to the church uh, before they left. So she said, can I sing a song? As part? She said, can I sing a song as part of worship uh, to say thank you to the, to the church for being so lovely to me and my family? And we said, yeah, sure, go ahead and do that, you know. And uh, so she gave her little uh, phone to the AV people and they plugged it in and we gave her a microphone. And as the music began, it wasn't anything uh, spiritual as you might have guessed and uh, as, uh, as I thought it was going to be. It was some pop song, you know, very sexual in its lyrics and she began to dance around the front of the stage singing. And, uh, and I, was, I was cringing inside and, and obviously everybody, uh, or, you know, there was, I guess, a little bit... Uh, sort of taken aback at what was happening and I thought, you know what, she's such a spiritual babe. Somebody is going to come to her afterwards and put a finger in her face and have a go at her and, and we'll lose her to the Lord because, uh, because we're not sensitive to where she's at spiritually. And you know what? Nobody said anything. Even though no one liked what happened, they appreciated the spirit in which it was done and they expressed love for her, she went and the relationship continues to be good. Isn't, it, isn't that a wonderful way to handle that situation? Uh, another lady that was a friend of mine, Julie, you know, has struggled with uh, different things like, um, 
you know, in her life, uh, you know, drug abuse and so forth. And she comes to church sometimes and sometimes she doesn't. And for long periods of time we can't contact her and we know that uh, we know that we can't get through to her, that there's a downtime in her life. But uh, all of a sudden we'll be able to get through to her and we'll be able to lead her back. And sometimes when she's coming back, she's not always dressed the same way as other people at church, doesn't always smell the same, but people love her and, uh, and she feels loved by her church. Wonderful, wonderful story. One more, okay, just one more. I was sitting in a church once and uh, worshipping, enjoying the worship service, and a friend of mine who had been door knocking brought a visitor along to church who was very interested in what we believe. And, uh, but he was addicted to tobacco, and he was, but he was very into the sermon, very interested into it. And, and so he, uh, after a while, felt like he needed a cigarette, but he didn't want to miss any of the sermon, so he just stepped just outside the door, uh, just outside the door to the front of the, near the stage and began to smoke. And the well, the wind was blowing towards the congregation, you know, so everybody's sitting there and the smoke's blowing across the congregation. And I thought, for sure, someone's going to have a go at him afterwards and maybe he won't ever come back because he doesn't know any different. Well, <clears throat> he should have done. He was standing right next to a no-smoking sign. But anyway, uh, he just, you know, just wasn't sensitive to the situation and for whatever reason did that. And, I, and there were so many people there that I could see were upset and offended by it. And I th- after worship, I ran straight up to him because I thought, if somebody comes over to him and begins to have a go at him, I'm going to stop them. And you know what? Nobody said anything. Everybody was lovely. And, uh, and he was able to continue with, uh, with Bible studies. And uh, that was this church. Did you know that? Does anyone remember that event? Yeah, it was right that door just over there. And that was in about 2011. Isn't that a wonderful um, testimony to how we can love people that are different to us and how we ought to do that? We're not always, always... Um, when people don't know the Lord, they're not always going to act the way that we want them to act. You know? We're not always... We can't always expect that they will. But if we're going to love them with our whole hearts, we're going to allow ourselves to be uncomfortable sometimes because Jesus has dealt kindly with us. Think about how we were when we didn't know Jesus and uh, how far we've come. And uh, the Lord dealt kindly with us through all of that and we ought to deal deal kindly with others. Uh, Matthew 25 verse 40, it says, The king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm the youth director in Tasmania. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I've been doing that for five years. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. We need those kind of reminders every now and again, don't we? Somebody said to me after a church service once, look at that girl over there with the bright purple hair. And I said, yeah, boy, I'm glad to see her. She's my granddaughter. (laughs) I'd much rather see her at church than anywhere else. And now we've come time for our offering. And, you know, we need to come into the Lord's house and give an offering. God says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness the world and those that dwell therein. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts, for the Lord loves cheerful givers. Deacons, would you be upstanding as we pray? Our loving Lord, you've given us so much. You've given us yourself, and therein is hope and salvation. And all your promises, Lord, are not just promises, they are in fact reality. For what you say you will do. Bless the givers, bless the deacons that collect the offering and may the offering be blessed as it reaches out to people that Pastor, like Pastor Daniel has been talking about today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Let's pray together one more time as we get into God's word, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to gather here with your people in your presence around your word. And Lord, as we open it, as we read it, as we allow it to speak to our hearts and sink into our hearts, I ask that your Holy Spirit will be here with us. And uh, and as you speak, Lord, give us healing. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're uh, beginning a new lesson, The Shepherd's Crucible. Sounds like the title of a film, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah, Crucible. What is a crucible? Sorry? Like a vessel? Who agrees with that? Beautiful. Uh, it's a what? Oh, a hot pot with you in it. Uh, yeah. If you've got any Chinese friends, you know that they love hot pot, but it's got nothing to do with heating metal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a crucible, that's right. It's used to, to heat metal and, uh, and to melt it down. So the idea is passing through fire. And so the shepherd, this image of a shepherd uh, passing through a crucible. And today we're going to study Psalm 23, so I'll ask you to open that and turn to it as we, uh, as we begin to, uh, to study together. And as you're turning it up well, I will uh, tell you a little bit about my uh, story. So when I first came to Jesus, I honestly believed that there was a contractual relationship with God based on my faith that had to do with whether or not my prayers would be answered. Has anyone journeyed through this before? If I believe enough, if I believe hard enough, then God will always do what I ask. Has anyone, I guess, made their way through that intellectually? Uh, Perhaps we have, perhaps we haven't. I had an experience where there was a lady that had uh, a quite severe heart condition and she was going uh, on her way to to go and have some heart surgery and I wasn't quite sure. It was 50-50 as to whether or not she was going to make it. And uh, the Lord impressed me to go and visit her and I prayed for her. This was before I um, came here to college. Uh, before I was, um, got into ministry and I put my hand on her shoulder and I prayed for her and uh, she said that she felt like a, you know, something happened within her and she had a scan before she had to go for the operation and they said, we don't have to do the operation, you know, the, the, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with your heart. So I took that experience and I thought, you know what, in that experience, in that situation, I truly believed that God was going to do what I asked and he was going to heal this lady. So if I just believe hard enough, then God will always do what I say. That's a little bit of a toxic relationship with God, isn't it? Anyhow, that's what I thought. So I got here to, uh, we got here to college, and this would have been in about 2009 or so. And uh, I think it was in 2010, my wife was three months pregnant, and uh, she began to bleed. And we were quite concerned, but I really believed that if I had enough faith and I prayed with all my heart that God was going to save our baby, Okay. And so even when she'd been to the hospital, I didn't even feel that I had to accompany to the, her to the hospital uh, because I thought, no, God is going to protect our baby. And, uh, and we went there, or she went there and had a scan and there was no heartbeat. She was totally, uh, you know, upset. And, and uh, anyway, we, but I, I still believe that God was going to give, her, uh, give us a, a resurrection in the womb. Uh, but, uh, but he did not. And uh, they actually sent her home from hospital. They said, just go home. It'll take care of itself. Don't even worry about it. Take a couple of Panadol. The pain for her was horrible. She said it was worse than, uh, you know, proper childbirth. It went on for like three days, uh, at the end of which time I had to flush our child down the toilet. And I was just so overcome with grief and horror. And you can just imagine it was just really, really terrible time for both of us. And uh, through it all, I was praying because I was having a bit of a faith crisis. God, what is going on here? What, you said that you, know, you were going to take care of us and here I'm in this really painful situation. And uh, I remember in particular, there was one, there was one experience that, uh, that sort of stuck out to me at that time. We were at Newcastle Hospital. We were sort of back and forth from hospital during this period. We went to the Newcastle Hospital and if you go there, there's a little chapel uh, off to the side of the entry foyer. And at that time, I don't know if it's still there or not, inside the chapel there was a little prayer tree. Has anyone been there recently? Is it still there? Don't know. There's a little tree and you write a prayer and then you put it on the tree. Okay? So I was there with my little daughter while um, her mother was being seen uh, by the doctor. 
And, uh, and I said, let's pray for our baby. So we wrote, dear Jesus, please save our baby, amen. And we put it on the tree. And, you know, obviously we lost the baby. So, God, where are you? Why didn't you do what you'd promised, I thought, and uh, going through this grief process. Uh, Twelve months later, um, uh, my wife's three months pregnant again. She starts bleeding again. I find myself in front of this prayer tree again in the Newcastle Hospital with my little daughter in tow again, and she says, can we pray for our baby? And immediately in my mind, I'm thinking, what's the point? It didn't work last time. But to, I guess, appease her and solidify her faith, I wrote down, on the, dear Jesus, please save our baby. Amen. We put it on the tree and we lost that baby too. What? Well, the only answer that God gave me through all of that was, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Thanks God, very comforting. Well, actually it is. Twelve months later I was holding my little son in my arms and I was able to get to a position where I could praise God for what I'd been through in the past because I knew that if we hadn't been through that experience then I wouldn't have this blessing. Isn't it funny how God sometimes can use the crucible in order to grow our faith, in order to give us experiences that we can use to share, that he can actually utilise our pain uh, to bring wholeness and bring healing. I don't understand it, and to be honest, it can be quite offensive to some people, particularly when they're going through very tough times. But nevertheless, this is the experience of Job. It's the experience of all those, as Paul said, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, they will suffer what? Do you know? Persecution. Thank you. All right. What's going through your head, I guess, as I share? Is it, I understand we've got a, uh, a microphone that is roving. Has anyone got any thoughts coming to them just as we, I tell that introductory story? Has it been your experience that, uh, that God has utilised your pain uh, in order to bring blessing? No hands. Let's move on. Okay. We'll get into Psalm 23, okay? Let's get into the text of the passage and uh, let's move, make our way through it. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. The Lord is my what? Shepherd, I shall not... We know these words so, so well, don't we? We don't have to read them from the Bible. Nevertheless, it's a good idea to have it in front of us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want... Did we have a hand over there, did we? All right, let's hit pause on that, everybody. We've got a comment. Thank you kindly. I just wanted to say that Sometimes when we ask God to save, you know, we've all, I'm sure, been in the situation where we want someone saved. Sometimes God saves, but not for this life. Mm. And it's very hard for us to think that um, at the time, but eternity is so much better than this life, and we don't always see it here, but I pray to God that we see it when we get there. And that's part of the hope of the life of faith, isn't it? I mean, what, if we didn't have the kingdom, what would be the point of getting up tomorrow? I really don't understand. I don't understand philosophical atheism. I don't. I met a man a few years ago who was living philosophically like an He was an atheist and he lived philosophically like one. Had been raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, gave up his faith and uh, decided there was no God and decided to live like one. And that was amazing to me because, and I actually respected him a little bit because he really lived philosophically like there was no purpose to life. I mean, you went to his house, there was not, hardly any furniture. He just had a little camp chair. He didn't ever talk to anyone. You know, he only ate, like, I don't know, like stuff out of a can and, you know, there was no pleasure in his life whatsoever. And I said, why is it that you live such a mean lifestyle? You're like a monk. He said, well, there's no purpose to life. There's no meaning to life. What's the point of any of it? And I thought, you know what? If you really, if you really don't believe there's a God, that's true. That's consistent, so I had a little bit of respect. We um, worked together for a little while and he, um, he's attending one of our churches again now. But the point is, if we don't have the hope, why get up in the morning? You know what I mean? I don't understand how people do it, who really believe that the universe is here for no reason, that really believe you're here for no reason, that it's just, we're all just a divine and cosmic, oh, not a divine, a cosmic accident. There is no reason why you're alive, there's no reason why your children are alive. And by the way, one day you'll disappear, one day the world will disappear, one day the universe will disappear with no more meaning than when it first appeared. Why do we even continue to put one foot in front of the other in this life if we're really consistent? But the hope of heaven, right? The hope of the kingdom, that this isn't the end, that we can get up in the morning knowing that we can, even though it's painful, we have to make our way through this crucible because one day everything will be okay. 
Yeah, thank you so much. It's beautiful. Any, uh, anyone else before we move into the passage? Okay. All right, the Lord. The Lord. Who's, who is the Lord? Can you, can you see in your Bible that that Lord there is in capitals? Can you see that there? Or miniature capitals? Have you noticed that? And do you know what that means? Have you noticed that some places in the Bible when it says the Lord, that it's capitalized and some places it isn't? Have you noticed that before? Yahweh, thank you, beautiful. This is, the, this is the divine I am. This is the Lord that spoke to Moses uh, from the burning bush. Uh, Yahweh, I am. There's a reflection of the Hebrew verb to be. Yeah, that's right, I am that I am. Uh, the, uh, the Septuagint translators, those 70 Jewish scholars that translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they didn't want to... Um, they wouldn't want to translate the, uh, the Lord's name, so they substituted uh, 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 the word for Lord in, um, uh, in, uh, in Greek, which is kurios. And so w- the King James and other English translators have continued the tradition of substituting Lord. Uh, and putting the, So that's what it means, though. This is the divine name. The one who always was and always will be, the Lord who is transcendent, is also imminent. The one that created the heavens and the earth is also right here with me, walking with me, uh, taking care of me like a shepherd. Shepherd, not the idea that you get in a, at an Australian sheep farm. I was at an Australian sheep farm a little while ago. There's a, a guy in a ute. He had a couple of dogs. He's riding, you know, he's running thousands of sheep there. This isn't the picture. The picture is of one man with, let's say, 40, 50, 100 sheep. You know, he cares and knows each one of them intimately. He's personally involved in guiding them, leading them, making sure they're okay. The transcendent Lord is right here with me and because of that, because of that, I shall not want or I shall not be in want. I shall not want. There's an aspect of providence here, right? There's an aspect of even material providence. David said elsewhere, your bread and your water will be sure. I was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, yet nor his seed begging bread. But more than that, there is a there is an internal providence. These existential questions we have burning within our hearts: Why am I here? Where have I come from? Where am I going? What's the purpose of my life? God is going to fill those needs. The Lord is my shepherd; I will not want. What does it mean to know that you're here for a reason? What does it mean to know that you're not an accident? What does it mean to you to know? How does it change how you'd live right now in this world today if you really believed that you weren't here for any reason whatsoever, that you're an accident? Would you live any differently or would it be the same? Yes. We got a, can we have a microphone over here, please? And we're one and then two. Okay, we'll go two and then one. That's fine. <laughs> I would think uh, the life that we live now as a Christian, referring to myself, of course, um, if there was no other reward after it, it's still the best life to live mm. if there's no other re- returns or afterwards. Because a Christian life is and should be a happy one if there's nothing else after it. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I actually resonate with that. I, know, I understand what I said before about the hope that things will get, get better. That's true. But how much better to know that the God of the universe is with me than to, uh, to know that I'm all alone down here. And I, I do believe that to walk with Jesus, even if there was no heaven, would be a better day than not to. Yeah. Yes? Beth is right when she says that because I think the same thing that if... God didn't exist, I would still want to live the life of a Christian Mm. because it has meaning to me. It has purpose. God created me. God has something for me, not just in this life, but after this life that is far beyond what the greatest happiness I could ever know on this earth. Mm. If it doesn't exist, it's still wonderful to live with that hope. You know, but I do believe, of course, that he does exist. But those who don't know that can only live a life of selfishness, Mm. a life where everything is for themselves. Even the man you were talking about as the atheist, he's still living a very selfish life. He's not helping anybody. Mm -mm. 
He's well, there's living, no reason if he does. Like, exactly. Even, you know, he's living it only for himself yeah. in the way that he wants to live it. And he, you said he doesn't talk to anybody. Who's he helping? But that, no matter what you're doing, if you don't know God or you don't believe in God, you can't live a life that's, that's mm. really f- beneficial to others. You may appear to be, but there's always a selfish motive behind it because there's no other way you can live that's if true. you don't believe in God. But believing in God, he gives you a purpose. Isn't it he beautiful? gives you a meaning. You're here because God exists. God loves us. God wants us to be with him forever. And that's a wonderful thing. It is. It's amazing. In fact, uh, Augustine, you know, he's obviously it's not the Bible. He was a church father. But he said in his, uh, you know, I think, it was, I think it was Confessions. I can't remember. Uh, Thou hast made us for thyself. You know, you made us for you. And the restless heart will wonder till it finds rest in thee. There's a sense that we're not... This idea of the God-shaped hole, you ever heard that before? There's something missing in here until God plugs it. I shall not be in one. Yeah, thank you. I recall when my brother died over a decade ago that it had the effect on me that, wow, I'm still alive. Mm. And it really emphasised in my thinking to live each day really well and and to make it count. Mm. And... uh, it, it made me recognise that the gift is just so precious and to, and to deal with it well and wisely. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that's, that's one, of the, one of the difficult things about loss, isn't it? Is that it always teaches us something. And, uh, and sometimes, yeah, you look back at the loss that you've, you've experienced over your life and you think, I wouldn't be the person today if I didn't, that I am today and if I didn't ha- experience that. But it's still painful to remember. Thank you. Okay, so I shall not be in want. So he's going to fulfill my needs, my inmost needs. Uh, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He's going to feed me. He's going to feed me. Is this just talking about grass here? What's it talking about? Spiritual food, you think. Does the Lord provide us spiritual food? This idea of a, of a deistic God is this idea that, um, you know, this is what Miller was before he, before he found the Lord. You know, the Lord created the universe, he wound it up uh, like a clock and then he walked off and left us here to ourselves. No, 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 not, not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture steps into history and, and feeds his people. He feeds them on his word. He feeds them on his word. He provides our spiritual needs, our thirst. I... Uh, was interested to go to Jerusalem in 2018 where I was privileged to be able to attend a Messianic Jewish synagogue. Do you know what this is? These, these are Jewish people who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah and they study uh, the, the New Testament along with the Old. Very, very interesting. They continue to worship as Jews and still do all of their ceremonies and, and liturgies and everything. Didn't understand the majority of the service because I only have a, understand a very little bit of Hebrew and it was all in Hebrew. Uh, but it was really wonderful. When they did the scripture reading, it was amazing. So the, the rabbi goes up to the front of the synagogue and at the front they've got what they call the ark, which is a pair of cupboards where they keep their Torah scrolls and the other bits of scripture. And uh, he took them out of these big scrolls and he's carrying them around the congregation. And as he does that, people are like touching them and as they're touching them, like, they might sometimes kiss them and they're weeping. And, uh, and he gets up and he does a scripture reading, which is some obscure reading from... Deuteronomy that, to my mind, you know, might not have any direct relevance to us today. Well, I thought at the time. I've since done a bit of study into the Pentateuch. It anyway, doesn't matter. I digress. Anyway, at the time, I thought, this, this isn't even relevant. And he's reading. He read for, I don't know, it was like 10 or 15 minutes. And people are weeping and they're listening and they're th- praising God. Why? Because this is the Word of God. You know, this is, God has spoken to, to me through this book. You know, and you might not agree with kissing the Bible. I, I get that. But the, just the atti- atti- attitude of reverence towards God's word. He has fed me. You know, he seeks to provide for me that which I need for spiritual nurture. And he leads me beside quiet waters and the water of life. <laughs> Don't you love that in Revelation 22? In fact, let's turn to it. Put your finger in Revelation tw- and Psalm 23 and come with me to Revelation 22 right at the end. And we'll read it. Uh, this last appeal uh, that, uh, that Jesus makes. Uh, right before uh, the, the end of the Bible. And uh, we're going to read verse 17. Make sure you keep your finger so we can flip right back to the psalm, all right? Uh, Ma- uh, Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, what does it say? Come. And let him who hears say, 
Come, and whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take what? Not just the water of life, the free gift of the water. Well, I've got an NIV. Mine says the free gift of the water of life. Um, I'm, I can't quite remember the, the way it's rendered in the King James. Can someone read it to me that's got a King James? Take of the water of life freely or something like that. It's just expressed. Is that how, is that how it goes? Beautiful. You know, it's a free gift. You know, th- th- my shepherd is going to give me what I need for spiritual sustenance. You know, he is going to be with me. Lovely. Okay. How is the Lord our shepherd? How? The idea of the God being our shepherd denotes intimacy. David understood this as he wrote the psalm. Uh, He had been a shepherd, as you well know. Can you imagine him sitting there under a tree, wondering about his brothers off at war, and a a bear comes, and uh, and he puts a rock in his sling and and, uh, and knocks that bear out, and uh, he feeds them and he guides them. He's carrying his rod with him, and, uh, and he's going to do two things with that rod. Well, three, really. He might use it sometimes to beat off a fox. He might use it sometimes to guide maybe his sheep that might be going off to the, in the wrong direction. He might also sometimes use it to give the sheep a bit of a whack on the backside when he really can't get them under control. Something about the intimacy of God here. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. What does that mean? He restores my soul. Yeah, we repeat these words. I've, my grandmother used to have it stitched, this psalm stitched, in, in a, what's it called, a cross stitch? I'm not very good with sewing stuff. Is that what it's called? And they, they make a little word thing out of it and they put it on the wall. Uh, I learned it off by heart uh, when I was in my teens. What does it mean, he restores my soul? What does it mean? You ever thought about it? This is not one of those uh, hypothetical questions that preachers ask when they don't really want an answer. I'm I'm really asking. What what does it mean that God restores our soul? Beautiful. So there's there's a rest. There's a sense of rest there. And uh, we know that we rest in God's presence. It's part of what the Sabbath does, doesn't it? It gives us spiritual rest. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? It also means that he wipes the slate clean and gives us a fresh start. Beautiful. So there's, you, you think that there's a sense of forgiveness of sin there? Absolutely. Mm. The, Lord, the Lord's servant says that uh, because of sin, the image of God in man has been marred and well nigh obliterated. You ever read that? marred and well obliterated and it's the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the mission of Christ in the world is to restore the image of God in man. Now, I, I don't know always what image of God exactly means in Scripture or in the Spirit of Prophecy. It's, sometimes it, it, you can see really clearly what it means. Sometimes it's, it seems even wider than that. But he restores my soul. I believe there's an aspect of salvation here, that uh, there's an aspect of restoration, there's an act- aspect of sanctification as we walk with God and we understand and we feed on his word, we understand his love for us and he speaks to us and he guides us that there is a restoration that happens, that our character changes over time. I believe that. That uh, that we are not the people that we used to be when we first met the Lord because our soul is being restored. A process, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Justification is the work of a moment. Sanctification is the work of a what? Lifetime. Thank you. He guides my paths in righteousness for his name's sake. Are your paths righteous? You ever heard a sermon like that? Are your paths righteous? Hmm. Think about your life. If you look back over the course of your life, have you do you consider your paths to be righteous? Is that a solemn question? Or are we just not feeling talkative today? You think it's self... You, you, you could be self-righteous. Yes, okay, I went to church every week and I served as a this, that and the other and, you know, I'm wearing a tie. And, okay, yes, yes, I've got righteous paths. 
I don't think it's got to do with what we do physically. I think it's got to do with something in here. Yes, thank you. Pastor Daniel. Psalm 23 is an amazing piece of work. Not only the way that it's put together, but also what comes before it, Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. Mm. What you've been talking about, you would be one of those in Psalm 22 that starts, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And here is Jesus on the cross. But it's also a picture of us with the life that we've lived and the suffering that we go through. We're in the crucible here. And this is where restoration doesn't take place until Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 is the psalm of the shepherd's crook. Now, a sheep and goat needs to be revived in the morning when you are treated the way you are in Israel. I stood on the top of the Herodium in Bethlehem and saw a shepherd with two of his mates and they were at the front. The sheep were behind them and behind them were the goats and they are put in a shed overnight. In the morning they're taken back out again for water and for food. There's the refreshing that takes place. And then you have the second half of the psalm where they're not fed, fed in the grass a table. A sheep doesn't eat off the table. In fact, the sheep is put on the table to be eaten. And so that's part of the shepherd's psalm as well. And so all of these things fit into, into our experience. But after the cross and after the crook, you ha have Psalm 24, where lo and behold... Here is the crown. Mm. And those three psalms go together and make the picture of what you're talking about. I'd, um, I'd even push it further to Psalm 25. I would argue, and I don't know, I haven't checked this in scholarly literature or anything, but I would argue that Psalm 25 is even, an, even more of an expansion of these same themes and, and some of those things that we're about to, to touch on. Psalm 23 seems to be like all of the things that are around it kind of contracted and then the, the, the psalms taking place sort of around it. I don't know if this is part of David's plan or not, but at least this is the way the Holy Spirit has ordered it when the scripture is compiled. The, those psalms expand on those themes. You're absolutely right. I agree with you. And um, yeah, it's a, it'd be an interesting study to do uh, to see how these relate to one another. Um, have we got another comment over here, have we? Or was... No, we didn't know. Thank you. No, thank you for sharing. So, we're going to be guided in pastoral... This has got to do with the relationship with God, and I agree with you. The cross comes first, and then we're going to walk with God, and Psalm 23 does describe a relationship with God. And this is the reason why it's very difficult uh, for us sometimes uh, who have a sense that, well, how can I best describe this? How are we going for time, by the way? Oh, i to hurry up. Um, who remembers the Bible story by Arthur Maxwell? Does anyone remember those books? Yeah, that were fabulous books. There was the Bible story and then there was another one called Bedtime Stories. Right? And my mum used to read them to me every night. And it's one of the reasons why I found all of these Bible verses are in my head. Why? Because mum used to read those to me. Wonderful books. Uh, don't agree with every page. Um, one in particular, there was one in the Bedtime Stories that was the story of uh, Belshazzar and Daniel which was really good. You know the story with the writing on the hand of the wall. So at the end of the story, there was a painting and it took up two pages in the book. And it, had, it was a picture of a measuring scale. You remember those old scales you used to measure, you know, what's uh, the weight of things? So there's a scale, it's got two sort of cups and, uh, and there's an angel in front of it and he's writing in a book. And for some reason, all of the angels in Uncle Arthur's books had a bob haircut. So he had a bob haircut, you know, hair down to about here. And he's looking at the scale and he's writing in a book. And on the scale, on one side, there's a bag. And on that bag is written the words, good deeds. Does anyone remember this picture? No, no memory. Okay. So, on the, so there's a, I wish I had it to show you. Well, I didn't know I was going to talk about it. So on the, there's a bag that said good deeds on one side. And the other side, the little cup, there was a little boy. And I knew that was me. And, and at the end of the story, it said, one day you'll be weighed in the balances. Will you be found wanting? 
God is weighing me up against my good deeds to see whether or not I'm going to make it to heaven, right? Now, I don't know if that's what Uncle Arthur meant or not. Probably not. But at least that was the picture. And pictures are big for kids. And, uh, and that impacted me very, very deeply. When we see God that way, when we've got that sort of arrangement with him where it has to do with what I do uh, to earn his love and his affection, we never ever have the sense uh, that, uh, that we've made it. Uh, because, well, only narcissists do, let me put it that way. If you meet people that are very self-centred and egotistical and narcissistic, they might sometimes get to the point where they feel like they've got it all together. But for the rest of us, what does the Lord's servant say? The nearer we come to Jesus, the more we become aware of our own sin. And, you know, if we have the sense that we can only make it because we're getting weighed up against good deeds, if we can only make it if we are, um, uh, you know, got it all together, no problems then we don't feel like we ever have. We have no salvation assurance. Okay? Uh, very sad situation. But what does it say here? God leads me in paths of righteousness. This is God's prerogative. This is God's initiative. This is God making a decision to stretch out his hand and take my hand and lead me along in life and to guide me through paths of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Not my righteousness. And thank you for your comment before. Whose righteousness? His righteousness that he is going to place his righteousness on my shoulders and he is going to judge me as his beloved son on the basis of what Jesus has done for me, not on the basis of what I've done for myself. And because when I understand that and I've got that straight, then I can go into verse 4 which says, I'll hit pause and take this comment and then we'll move on. Yes, go. Uh, we've got a, a microphone over here, please. Thank you. Put your hands up, we'll find out. Mm-hmm. To me, the key of that section, that he leads me in paths of righteousness, is for his name's sake. Beautiful. That's why he leads us at all. It's so that we will glorify him and we will have eternity with him. And that's what it's all about. He doesn't lead us in paths just for the fact that he wants to see us have a hard time or anything like that. He leads us for his namesake. His name is what his character is based on. Amen. His name is what the whole of heaven and earth is staked on. Isn't it a wonderful study, the idea of God's name as it pertains to the community throughout, particularly the Old Testament, but it continues into the New. You know, in the, the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not take... The name of the Lord thy God in vain. What does that mean? Does it, well, it means I'm not, I shouldn't use it in swearing and that's the way that it's most commonly interpreted. But it's, got, it's much deeper than that, much deeper. In fact, uh, at the, in the tabernacle service, the high priest... Uh, I'm just going to put my microphone down for a while and, and show you something, okay? Just a minute. as uh, the tabernacle service was over, he would make that symbol over the people. This is in number six. Oh, well, the symbol isn't. That's Jewish tradition, but the, the description of the blessing is. And, uh, and the, re- the reason why he'd do that is he was making the Hebrew letter Shin, which is the first letter of the word Shaddai, which is one of the names of God. Okay? And he would make the symbol over the people and he'd say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face. You, you know, the... the a poetic benediction. The Lord lift up his face and uh, shine on you. The Lord turn his face towards you, be gracious to you. And then the text says, and in so doing, he will put the Lord's name upon the people and they will be blessed. And so God's name, God's very name gets placed physically upon the people as they participate in worship and they go forth from worship representing God. Now that just got solemn because you and I walk forward from church into the world bearing the name Christian. And did you know that people are watching you to find out what Jesus is like? Did you know that? You'd be surprised who in your life knows you're a Christian and is watching you to see if there's consistency and is judging their opinion of God, of the church, of the gospel, on uh, how you love, how you live, how you relate to those around you. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This is a serious thing. Here, for the sake of, my, of God's name, he is going to lead me. The Holy Spirit is going to move inside of me and motivate me and he is going to drive me to paths of righteousness. Not my work, his work in me and through me as I submit to the commandments of his word. Why? For his name. 
even though, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And now we get to the crux of it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How did I get into the valley of the shadow of death? Did I wander in there on my own? No. We had no say in it. Adam led us into the valley of the shadow of death. And so long as the world exists in its sinful state, we are all walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But we need fear no evil, for God is with us. Mm. We have our own valleys that we go through of times of trouble, but the whole world is in the valley of the shadow of death. Mm. Just go down and have a look at the cemeteries. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Well, uh, for sure, and all of us have, we, we have peaks and valleys in our life, don't we? There's sometimes when you have high spiritual experiences, when you feel, uh, w- the young people say, hashtag blessed is what they say. They say they're, they're going well and everything's going fine and then you have the valleys where things seem to be going south and, you know, it doesn't matter what you do, do every time you turn around there's another health problem or someone's ill or, or you know, somebody passes away and, and the car blows up and it, we have these ups and downs in our life. Everyone is subject to that valley, the shadow. I think uh, that that we can use this, maybe it's not consistent with the scripture, but we can use this as an illustration of the influence of those shadowy beings that follow us around from moment to moment, attempting to do their work in our lives, what we understand as being demons, fallen angels, Satan and his works, they're against us. And then there's death, as you've pointed out, absolutely. uh, Time gets all of us, it's undefeated, And uh, the longer we hang around down here, no matter how many works of righteousness we do, the more likely it is that uh, that there will come a day when we won't wake up. And that's solemn, but it's true. And uh, as we're down here in this world, all of us are exposed to those three things. These three things are the cause universally of fear, of terror, of uh, despair in the world, particularly in the pagan world, fear of death, fear of ageing, fear, uh, fear of the enemy, uh, fear of the, of the ups and downs of life. Maybe I won't be able to feed myself. I've got to do what I can to provide for myself financially because when these troughs come, I'm not going to make it. No, 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 no. When I'm walking with... By the way, I think sometimes... I do believe, as you, as you pointed out accurately, that, uh, that we're here because, uh, because our first parents put us here. But there's a sense in which the difficult times we walk through, we're also, do we think God has left us? Did he lead us through these valleys? Sometimes tempted to think that. Did he, was it his will that bad things happened to us? No. Okay, well then we have, to, we have to distinguish, right? Because did he leave us when we went through hard times? No, because he said the basis of me fearing no evil is what? What's the basis of me fearing no evil? Because thou art with me. Because you're, I don't have to be scared even though I go through these things because you're with me. God didn't leave me and this is the temptation sometimes when we're going through something hard to think that God has left or he's not paying attention. No, no, no. He's right here. He's with. But it's not his will that we experience pain and suffering and yet why didn't he do something about it? He, he does. Said, yes. Uh, Looking at my experience in life, I left the church. I was in the world. I wasn't looking for God. And yet, when I was in the roughest time of my life, He came looking for me. Mm. He even sent people, the right people, to bring me out of what I was in. I wasn't looking for Him at all. I wasn't praying. But yet, that's a sign of a true shepherd. In my life, God has been my shepherd. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw... Can you finish it? All men unto me. How many men? All. And by the way, that implies women as well. um, I will draw. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to respond. Like a fish on a hook, some of us are going to fight and some of us are going to get away. But I will draw. God's active in my life, drawing me to himself before my initiative of wanting to pursue him. And that's good news to me sometimes because he who began a work in, a good work in me will complete it under the day of the Lord Jesus. But we need to struggle sometimes and this is the key issue here of why does God allow some things to happen in our life? Yes? 
We need to struggle with, the, with it. It's a difficult question. It's one of the key questions that people reject God on when they turn their back on God or they decide he doesn't exist. One of the key reasons is, I don't understand where he was when this bad thing happened. Yes? God has to look at the bigger picture. And uh, when you look at an individual's suffering in the context of the great controversy, then you realise that there's there's this tussle going on between God and Satan all the time. And the book of Job re reflects it fairly well. Mm, God absolutely. has a plan, but, but Satan, because it's a controversy, he has to be given some freedom to act, otherwise there's no, there's no controversy. Mm. And therefore, when, we, when Satan brings suffering to us, sometimes God has to step back like he did in the case of Job and say, well, you're allowed to do so, such, such and such or so much. But ultimately, God's wisdom and love is what determines what he allows Satan to do. Mm, thank you kindly. So beautifully articulated, Pastor. Yes, beautiful. Um, yes, and as the... Yes, go. Yeah. There's a, a picture that is shown of footsteps in the sand yes. and the person said, God, you promised to walk with me through my troubles and then he says, there is only one set of footsteps in the sand here and God said that is when I carried you mm. through your hardest times so God carries us if we can't do it alone Isaiah 41.10 do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand wonderful aren't we blessed to have the great controversy truth because the great controversy truth places this whole problem, the problem is called the issue of theodicy, it places it in the context of a, of a system that allows us to make sense of these very difficult questions. Why is it that things are tough down here? Because we're in a war zone, actually. You can't expect in World War I to be walking around in, the, in no man's land and, and not, uh, you know, not have a few uh, shells exploding around you and, or have a few rounds clipping your helmet. This is where we are. We're in a, in a battle. But the point is, Christ has overcome the world that the victory is won because of what Jesus did on the cross and it's just a matter of time before that's realised here. As I make my way through this war zone, I'm going to go through difficult times. But I can have faith and know that one day he's coming back and all things will be right again. Okay? This is... I don't know what you do without this truth. Can you imagine believing in God and not understanding that there's a battle going on? And this is... It's kind of frustrating as I read Job, I'll be honest with you. You know, Job's a wonderful story. Who here has ever been inspired or encouraged by the story of Job? Put your hand up if you felt, you know, Job really understands what I'm experiencing here and, you know, and I'm glad that this is in the Bible. Do you know Job never has his questions answered? Do you know that? He has his fortunes restored, but God never tells him about this controversy that's gone on between himself and Satan. In, he never finds out about it. As far as Job's aware, God did this to him. That's his understanding. And God never corrects him. He just says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? It's your job to believe. It's my job to be God. You put your faith in me and just trust that I'll take care of you. And Job's, you know, basically he submits to that instruction. The whole argument is never clarified to him. And he goes to the grave. And one day, he's going to wake up and go to heaven. And all of us will be lining up saying, thank you so much for what you did millions upon millions of people down through the history of, uh, of, of the faithful. Uh, we believe the book of Job was written by Moses, so it's one of the... Some people think it was the first book ever put to paper before even Genesis it was written. And, uh, and all of these faithful people down through history are going to be there in heaven because of Job's experience. And I think he'll be praising God for going through what he went through then. Yes? When we get really discouraged, it's very easy to say, where is God? Mm. Even Jesus said, why have you forsaken, forsaken. me? But where was God? Right beside Jesus, and he will be right beside us too. And this is the gift of the scripture, to see in, into the veil and to see the arms of God wrapped around us in our, in our hardship and our pain. Let's push to the end of the chapter. What time do we normally finish? Just so I know. Now, right now, in this moment. Let's push to the end. I'll tell you one story, and then we'll be done, okay? 
Okay, I fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. This implies that there may sometimes be providence in the discipline of God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Look at that. The reason why God allows us sometimes to go through the crucible is so that we have something to share. We've got overflowing. And, uh, and I can't, it seems that I can't really help someone else unless I've been through some hardship myself. And this is part of the blessing going through the, the valley. Verse 6, Surely goodness and love will pursue me or follow me uh, all the days of my life. Look at this. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what we call that in the fundamentals of our church? We call that salvation assurance. In the, um, the fund- our fundamental belief on the gospel, it says, because of what Jesus has done for us, we've got assurance of salvation now and in the judgment. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John put it this way, um, this I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might know that you have eternal life and that by believing in his name. Beautiful. Let me tell you one story and then I'll pray and we'll be done. Okay, I understand we've gone over time. I apologize. Uh, Last year in, no, 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 sorry, year before last in November, uh, my dad rang me and let me know that he'd been diagnosed with, uh, with pancreatic cancer. So he was uh, 60 years old, just about to... Well, he was 59 at the time, yeah. Uh, so that was pretty shocking, you know. Uh, he was just about to retire. What he wanted to do was to retire and come and spend, move... Well, spend a lot of time with me because he just loved ministry, loved Bible studies, loved anything to do with ministry. He was going to come and live near me and then follow me around as I did my ministry stuff and we were going to do that together and I was looking forward to that. He's a faithful elder in the church for a number of years. And uh, so November, he f- we find out he's got pancreatic cancer. Uh, I think it was in getting towards the end of February and I flew up there and uh, he's getting towards the end of his life now. You know that uh, pancreatic cancer works very quickly. Uh, well, I should say, by the time you know you've got it, um, it's working very quickly, okay? And so he's coming to the end now and uh, struggling within himself with self-forgiveness. He can believe that God forgives him he can believe that, uh, uh, that other people can forgive him, but he can't seem to forgive himself. And this is causing a sense of unrest, a lack of peace within, as he sort of approaches his final moments. So I sat with Dad and prayed with him and we, I helped him through that issue. I uh, got him to repeat the words, I forgive myself, over and over again until he was able to sort of drop off to sleep. Anyway, uh, after a period of time, it was maybe the next day, my mum... Uh, called me. She was there at the hospital keeping the, keeping the midnight vigil and she let me know that, I don't know, maybe this might be hard for some people to hear, but sometimes as people are getting close to the end and they're not conscious, uh, the, the swallow reflex goes and there's a, there's a sort of rattling sound that emerges. It's, it's pretty horrible. Uh, but she called me to let me know that that had ha- started and just to come in to be with her because she was struggling. Sometimes it, the person will continue to live for a few days after that starts. But uh, as I went into the hospital, I sat with mum and as, I, as we were talking, the sound stopped. It ceased. So we rushed over and uh, we called the nurse, you know, pressed the button and uh, we put our hands on dad's shoulder and uh, held each other's hand. I just had my, hand, my right hand right here on my dad's shoulder, my left hand right here on my mum's hand and we prayed for dad. By the time I said amen, I felt uh, with my hand on his shoulder that his life was gone, that he was no longer there. He died while I was praying for him. And uh, I sort of just, I dealt with it, like in the moment, I, we, we had a lot of things to do, we had to organise a funeral and everything, then I had to get back and go back into ministry, and it hit me in about February this year, just before February this year, the, just the pain, just this pain that I can't even describe, you know, just a sense of grief and loss, I was totally debilitating, and I, I never felt anything like it, because it was, at no point on my body could I point to where it hurt. But there was just all of this pain and I was just crying up to God, crying out to God one night and he, he said, you know what, I'm your father now. And, and I, don't, I don't understand why it is uh, that we have to go through this down here. But I do know that as I prayed for my dad as he was dying, it was not with a lack of hope. It was with the knowledge, and this is the reason why I've been able to move past that pain, is because I know it's not goodbye, it's see you later. There's going to come a day when we're going to be reunited. And I think that after the first billion years of eternity, 
I'll look back at that moment and it won't even seem like anything to me, you know. And I have to sometimes step back through the light of the great controversy and see the valley of the shadow of death as something that God is bringing me through in order to save not just me, but those around me as well. Shall we pray? And uh, I would like for us to pray. Let's pray Psalm 23, okay? So we'll pray together and I'll just turn it around so that it's a prayer. Lord, please be our shepherd. Provide for us. Lay us down in your green pastures. Lead us beside your quiet waters. Restore our souls. Guide us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, Lord. Even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, give us strength to fear no evil because you're with us and your rod and your staff comforts us. Prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies, Lord. Anoint our heads with oil. Cause our cup to overflow. And we know that surely your love and your goodness will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell with you in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Apologise for going over, over time, loved ones.
Well, good morning, everyone. It is my privilege this morning to welcome each and every one of you to our Divine Service Hour. To our visitors, we extend to you a warm welcome on this chilly morning and wet morning too. Um, to our regular members, I uh, thank you that you've returned to support us. And to those of you who may be watching uh, on our media, various channels, I welcome you too to our uh, time this morning. I've just got a few housekeeping items we need to, uh, to look at this morning. And we're going to vote in, because we're having our second reading of some people who are sadly leaving Avondale Memorial Church and also uh, someone who's coming to our church. So I'll just read through the names again. Uh, coming to Avondale Memorial Church, we have Brendan Tucker from Toronto Church. And uh, leaving us, we have Gabrielle Dennis, who's going to Worthington, Ohio in the US. We have Kay Hardman to Epping in New South Wales. And we have Michael Maidman to Gosford, New South Wales, and Karen Rankmore to, uh, I think it's pronounced, uh, Gainda, Queensland. So I'm wondering if we can have someone move that uh, these transfers take place. Yes, we have someone move. Someone second it. Uh, all in favour? You can raise your hands. Thank you. Any opposed? That has been carried. I was challenged last night. I watched the testimony of a man who um, suggested that for people to understand a little bit more of the love of Christ, they read the first chapter of the Desire of Ages. And so last night and this morning, I actually did that. And I thought I'd share something with you that comes from uh, page 25 of the Desire of Ages. And this is just about Jesus. By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. What a thought that is. In taking our nature, the Saviour has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice, he gave him to the fallen race. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one with the human family, forever to retain his human nature. And I'm sure we'll all study that for an eternity to understand it better. And just one other thing. I believe uh, Stephen Aveling Rose has a birthday today. And for those of us who are a little bit older, he's turning 24. Or was it yesterday? Sorry, I'm happy to be corrected. Happy birthday, Steve. Hope you have a blessed Sabbath. Thank you. Ancient words. Alinge de Chazo wrote this. There are many today who claim that the words of the Bible are old-fashioned, outdated and passé, saying that something written 2,000 or more years ago have no relevance or application to today's society so that we need a new gospel for a new age. However, those who truly believe in God understand that the divine creator was able to reveal his will in such a way so that even though it was penned in times past, it still has meaning and authority for all generations. Thus, we recognise the need for us to pay attention to those ancient words.
Christianity's distinctives is that we worship a God who has spoken and who is not silent. From God the Father speaking the word into creation to speaking through his living word in Christ to speaking by his spirit through the written word. When we open our hearts we will hear the word of God speaking to us through many avenues. in worship this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Pastor Stephen Duncan, and it is my um, both pleasure and a great honour to be one of the pastors that serves here at Avondale Memorial Church. 
We've got a couple of announcements just for our ministry focus segment time. And the first one is Pastor Stephen Magadis, who was here this morning. He's actually had to leave a little bit early because his daughter is preaching at Toronto Church and he's really excited to go over there and spend time and listen to her. So throughout today, I'd just love to encourage you to just send up a quick prayer um, for Pastor Stephen's daughter, Alessandra, as she also preaches at this time. Um, also, myself and my wife, we will be away for the next week, so it will just be Pastor Stephen Megatus in the office. If you do need to contact a pastor or anything, he'll still be available during the usual times that the church office is open. And as a third thing, if you do have children and they have been attending our Fun for Kids playgroup, which operates regularly on a Wednesday morning, that will be closed during the school holidays, but we'll be restarting that again as soon as the next term three starts off. So I hope God blesses you today in this place that you feel his presence and that you're able to see more of his love today. God bless. It has come time for us to worship the Lord through prayer. And for those of you who are able, I invite you to kneel. We'll take an attitude of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we acknowledge you as the creator of all things, the sustainer of the one of this universe, the one who brings life to all, Lord. And we thank you that indeed we can acknowledge you. We thank you that it's Sabbath, Lord, and that we can have rest, that we can lay aside the burdens of the week and come and worship you and rest from our works, Lord. Today, Lord, we would like to ask a blessing upon Pastor Stephen Duncan as he presents to us and opens to us your word. We pray that his, your spirit will be with him and guide him. And Lord, that we may hear your voice speaking through him. Lord, also today we pray for our church here. Lord, you know the members, you know them individually, you even number the hairs of our head. And Lord, today we just pray the blessing upon those and also those who are visiting us. Lord, we pray that you will bless them. Lord, we ask that indeed we may be drawn closer to you on this Sabbath. We thank you that we can worship you freely in this country. We thank you that we still can acknowledge you in our lives and pray for people. Lord, today I ask that indeed we may be blessed as we worship you and that our worship may be acceptable to you. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the deacons to come forward at this time as we lift our offering and our offering today will be for our local church which as you've probably noticed our church is getting older and when things get old as I'm beginning to discover you have to spend money on things and so our church is, uh, needs funds to sustain it and I just pray that uh, today, as you give, you will give through a generous heart. Lord, let, let us just bow our heads now and ask a blessing upon our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have means to return to you, Lord. We know that you are own everything. You sustain us. You provide for us. And Lord, today, as we return to you, our tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray you'll bless them. Uh, bless the maintenance of this church. Bless the mission of this church, Lord that uh, indeed we may be a light in this community and not just here but around the world that we can help in the furtherance of your gospel. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you very much for sharing your gift of music with us, Stephen, this morning. I'd like to take a motion that um, we refer to all Stevens at our church as their middle name now, because there's way too many of us. <laughs> um, just before we begin, I have a little bit of a disclaimer for this message. And in this message, I'm going to say some things that will come across as very controversial. I want you to just hold on, because I promise as we unpack um, scripture today and see what the Lord says for us, that you will understand by the time we come to the end that what I'm preaching here really is a message for our community today. So as we delve in, I'd love to invite you to just bow your heads with me as we invite the Lord once more to guide us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are, for being our God, for being our Savior and being our King. And as we delve into the word this morning that you will lift our hearts to you, and that Jesus will be lifted up here in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think about this for a moment. Where does your faith come from? For some of you, it might have been as a child. For some of you, it might have been something that you have adopted through life. For some of you, it might have been at maybe an event, it might have been at a series of meetings that somebody presented, it might have been somebody impacting you in a certain way where you saw something different for them. It could be a lot of different things. But where does your faith come from? A few years ago, I was involved in an overseas evangelism trip, and this was my very first one. I was really excited. I was a new college student at Avondale at the time, studying theology, and I got this opportunity, and they said, hey, why don't you come with us, and we're going to fly across the other side of the world to Mexico, and we're going to share the love of God in a little town called Guadalajara. I had no idea where this place was. I'd never been to Mexico. I'd never been to the Americas. And I was really excited to go there. And when I arrived there, we were given all these different messages that we had to preach, which slowly unpacked who God was. And at the start of every single series, we had to say this. We would sit down with the whole congregation and encourage them to say, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's in the Bible, it's enough for me. And we did this every single message, every single night for two weeks straight. We'd get up, the first thing that we'd say is, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's in the Bible, it's enough for me. And we would do this over and over and over again throughout the whole series, but it really started to challenge me. Because I look around our situation that we have today. And if you heard in the news, there's been a bit of a change with the most recent census that has come out. If you heard on the news, there was this increase. And it said, for those people, when they filled out the religious aspect of the Australian census last year, 39% of people put non-religious on their census data. Comparing this to 2001, where it was 16% putting non-religious, and 69% putting it as Christian. There's been this dramatic shift in the last 20 years. Can we jump to the next slide? My clicker's not playing ball. And so if you ask a person why they stopped being a Christian, oftentimes the core reason for that is they just stop believing what the Bible says. And I think that's really sad, because for their perspective, they say that there's too much conflict going on. There's too much nonsense. When they look at different stories in the Bible, they see all this conflicting evidence. And I think it's actually really sad because these people, they might have grown up in the church. I know a lot of people sitting here today and watching online, I've sat in your homes, and a really common pain is that we did everything right, but our kids don't come to church anymore. They say they don't believe in God. What went wrong? We did everything we were taught. We did everything that was correct. And there's this question that hangs over our heads going, what's going on? 
We did it to the best of our ability. We followed God, but something has changed. And I believe the thing that has changed is our culture. Can we go to the next slide, please? Because I believe that every single parent, every single member of a church and of a community does their utmost to be able to share God's love with the people around them. But it's sad because a lot of people just don't believe what the Bible says anymore. And I think it stems from an assumption that we share. Can we jump to the next slide? And this assumption is, the Bible is the foundation of our faith. We make this assumption. But unfortunately, the generation that is growing up now looks at the Bible differently. And I'm going to delve into it now because this has caused a big challenge for us today. So what I want to, want to do today is actually go back and look at how Christianity first started before the Bible even existed, when there was pressure from the Pharisees who believed that these Christian and who these Jesus followers were heretics, and the Romans who saw these same group of people as some annoying religious sect. Can we jump to the next slide? And I want to ask the next, this question today. What was the driving force for that first generation of Christians? They did not have what we refer to today as the Bible. They did not have the Bible to place their faith in. They did not have a church that we have today that they grow up in that taught them what to believe and how to believe it. This first generation of Christians lived a different life and they died for what they believed. But they didn't die just for what they believed. They died for what they said they saw. This first group of Jesus followers, they put their lives on the line not for a belief that had been passed down from generation to generation, but because they saw something and they believed that that thing that they saw was life-changing. Can we jump to the next slide? Think about these questions. What did they base their faith on? What reasons did they use to explain their faith? And I think this last one is the biggest of all. How strong was their faith? How strong does our faith have to be to willingly put our lives on the line? For a lot of people, especially these days, yeah, the list gets smaller and smaller. But these people believed in it so much, they put their lives on the line for something that was greater than themselves. Can we jump to the next slide? I believe their call was this, that we must tether the faith of this generation to the event, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that sparked the movement, which is Christianity, that brought us the Bible. I'll say that again. We need to tether the faith of this generation to the event, which is Jesus. He came, he lived, he died, and he rose again that sparked the movement, the disciples who actually saw Jesus in action in day to day and saw his sacrifice and his resurrection. And that movement brought out Christianity and that Christianity brought us the Bible. I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. Here is one of our... I suppose people refer to him as one of the early church leaders or the greatest evangelist of all time or somebody who did so much for the following and for the sharing of the gospel. This is a message written by Paul to a church in Corinth. And he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. If Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. That's a big statement. The faith of Paul didn't hinge on stories that he was grown up getting told about. The faith of Paul hinged on something that he saw. 
because Paul says he saw Jesus with his own eyes as he was traveling, ironically, to go and kill a bunch of people who believed in Jesus and who saw Jesus do his works and who saw Jesus get resurrected. Paul's on his way to kill him and he sees Jesus himself. And so Paul writes this, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is also in vain. If you'll turn with me again to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and he asks them a question. And this is a great question because the disciples, they've just been having this discussion on who the Pharisees say Jesus is and what kind of role Jesus actually has. And Jesus asks them this question, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered this, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And continuing, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood, that is humanity, did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. The rock that Jesus refers to here is a very specific one. Some people interpret this rock as Peter. Peter was one of the core leaders in the New Testament following of Christ. We call it the church today. Peter was that. But the rock that, God is, that Jesus is referring to here, I uh, believe, is slightly different. The rock that he's referring to is the phrase that Peter said, you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. That statement, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is the rock that the church is built upon. This is the rock, this is that core thing that will not move. Jesus refers to it in other spaces as the cornerstone. This is the core aspect of Christianity. Jesus Christ was born, he lived, he set a wonderful example for us to look to, to aspire to, to follow, to try and implement in our own lives. He then came and died for us. And then he rose again. Paul says, if Jesus kind of just came and he lived his life and then he died and, yeah, that was it, not a very inspiring person to follow. But he rose again. And the fact that Jesus rose again says something else. Because if somebody is able to predict their own death and then resurrection and then pull it off, I kind of think that's somebody worth following. And this is what Jesus does. And this statement, you are Christ, the son of the living God, is the statement that the church is built upon. And the last thing I'd like to point out is a bit of an interesting story. There was a young man who was involved in the New Testament church at the time, and his name was James. James knew that his faith should be placed in Jesus, but his story is the most interesting of all because James's brother was Jesus. I kind of think James's reaction when he first was told or first experienced the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, he would have had some questions. If your siblings or if one of your close friends came to you and said, I'm Jesus, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one everybody's looking forward to, you probably look or have a face like is what is about to come up on that next slide. Can we jump to the next one, please? You probably look at them a little bit strange, right? But this is the journey that James is going through. He's gone through this phase where my brother is claiming to be the Messiah. Hold on a second. I grew up with him. I know him. And we don't have time to go through all the different biblical proofs for this. And if you want them, come and chat with me afterwards. Happy to point them to you. But we get to this point in Acts chapter 15 where there is an early church leader who steps up, and it's James. James is the one who steps up and says, Hey, guys, as a gathering of people who follow Jesus, we need to act in this way when it comes to introducing new people to who Jesus is. And if James is so sold out that he's willing to help the entire gathering move forward in following Jesus, it means 
he's pretty convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. And he also wrote a letter as well. You can read it at the end of Scripture. It's just titled, according to his name, The Book or the Letter of James. So we have all these different people who are tethering their faith not to a book, but to a life and an event that sparked a movement that brought us the Bible. Can we jump to the next slide, please? Faith, event, movement, scripture. That's how what we get to hold in our hands today, often completely freely, came to exist. So this begs the question, what is the big point of the Bible? Well, we can look at the Bible in this way. Can we jump to the next slide? I want you to encourage... Uh, I want to encourage you to look at the Bible as though it's a safe. Can we go one more slide, please? There once was an Egyptian archaeologist, and he had a very keen interest in an ancient pharaoh, Ramses II. And in his many trips to Egypt, he went there and he found so many different artifacts and interesting things that referred to him. And so he gathered them all up and he collected them all. But he wanted to keep them safe, so he went and he put them in the place where he knew they wouldn't be tampered with, that they would be changed. He put them in a heavily locked safe. Can we have the next slide, please? And he comes and he puts them there. And he does lots of trips, all the way out into Egypt, down into Cairo, going around all the different pyramids, digging in through the sand, finding all these different really special aspects about Ramses II. And the more he found out about this ancient pharaoh, the more he became interested in him. And the more he became interested in him, the more he wanted to share with other people. And every now and then he'd go to his safe, he'd open it up, he'd take something out, and then he'd show it to people and say, hey, wow, this is fantastic. I love this sort of thing. It's so interesting. It's so fascinating. And he did this throughout the whole of his life. And he collected as much as he could, big things, little carved images of him, little hieroglyphs, things that he dug up out of the ground, just like tiny little references, or even just referring to things that Ramses II did during his reign. He would say, hey, I want to take that too, and I want to put it in this safe where it can't be destroyed, where it will be available forever. Eventually, this archaeologist gets old, And he's no longer able to do these trips anymore, but he still goes around sharing what he's learned about Ramses with lots of other people. And then as time moves on, he gets older again, and he's unable to do it. And he passes this on to his kids, because they've picked up an interest in this story too. And so they go back to the safe, and they open it up, and they take a couple things out, and they show it to some people as well. And they get really interested in it too, and then it gets passed on to the third generation, who... He's a little bit interested, but it was kind of granddad's thing, and he's old, and we're not really interested in that anymore. We're interested in something else now. And so eventually, this amazing collection of things that referred to this great Egyptian pharaoh begins to just sit there, and it begins to gather some dust. Generations pass by, and somebody finds this safe, And after a long time, he's able to open it up again, and they find this amazing collection. No one's ever seen it before, of these references and images to this great pharaoh of Ramses II. But they look and they get confused because there's so much stuff there. There are some interesting stories there about Ramses, and there are some images made of him that kind of look like him, and then there are some references to things that he did, and it becomes a little bit confusing for some people because they don't know where to start. They don't know which are the core things that really help start that understanding of who this person was. Now, when we think about putting stuff in a safe, do we put it in there because it has value or do we put something in it to gain value? 
if I put a $5 note in a safe, and then I walk away, and then I come back, and I'm expecting it to be like, open it up, oh, look, it's 10, duck, 10 bucks now. Um, that doesn't quite work, does it? We put something in a safe because it has value because we believe that it has a purpose and that it is special and that it is defined for something great and unique. This is the safe that has been passed down generation to generation. What we call the Bible is the safe that holds all the things that point to Jesus. And when we open it up and when we look at it, if we know what we're doing, it's really exciting because there are so many different things about it. There are eyewitness accounts of what Jesus himself did. We have four different ones in there. We call them the Gospels. We have eyewitness accounts, again, of what these people did in the following years ahead, in the decades to come. We see that all written down in there. But also in the Bible, we have these different aspects of poetry and some stories about people who believed that Jesus was to come but never saw him and the faith of people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that space and the trust that they showed. We also have different things which we like to refer to as prophecy, where prophecy is something that specifically points to Jesus in some way, shape, or form or an action that he does or has done, or will do. And we have this great opportunity to open up and look. There's poetry. There's some amazing letters of people who have walked with wonderful people. There are historical accounts of how God has worked with different people throughout the ages. But for somebody who is new, for somebody who has grown up just being told you have to do what's in the Bible, it can be a challenge Because there are some stories in Scripture that without actually understanding the purpose for them being included can really throw us to left field. It can really knock us around because we can see horrible stories in the Bible as well for how people who claim to be followers of God have acted. Which interestingly is not too similar to the case that Australia is facing today. So as followers of Jesus, we need to uplift Christ. So when we talk about faith, we need to make sure that our faith isn't grounded in a safe, but our faith is grounded in a historical event. That is Jesus who came and lived and showed us how to live and died and was risen again. And he says this in John chapter 16. My apologies, that should say 16. John chapter 16, verse 32. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. When we lift up Jesus, his story, the way he worked with people, the way he led people, the way he taught, the way he's taught us to live our lives, when we lift up Christ in our lives, People are drawn to him. Now, everything else in that safe is still really important. Don't get me wrong. I believe it is such a beautiful thing that we have so much available that show us the character of God and how Jesus has worked. But when we encounter somebody who either hasn't experienced much of who Jesus is before or looks at the Bible and goes, oh, what the heck, there's just a bunch of really weird and stupid and strange stories in here. We need to point them back to the source, that event, those eyewitness accounts. We call them the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you're kind of interested, maybe, in jumping into Christianity and seeing what it's about, I'd love to encourage you to jump in and have a look at what we refer to as the Gospel of John. Because this is an eyewitness account of a man who was young. Scholars think that he was probably a teenager at the time, which is really fascinating. But here's this, what we would call a kid, who saw how Jesus acted, 
who writes down in great detail what Jesus is all about. And we get to that famous verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. Believing in Jesus, believing that what Jesus did happened, by trusting those eyewitness accounts and then seeing what Jesus did is the change that I believe our generation needs. Because if we do that, we can really take everything on board and we don't get challenged by it anymore. We begin to really take hold of the value of that event. And when we let that impact us and how we see God, he literally, that he literally came and gave his life for us so that we can have the opportunity to live with him. We can stand and confidently say, number one, following Jesus has made my life better. And it's made me better at life. Those two things go hand in hand. Number one, following Jesus had made my life better. And it's made me better at life. And then all those other aspects of Scripture kept in that safe, as we begin to unpack them, they all slowly build up the character of who God is. They help us see more of who God is and his character and help us understand how God works. And as we slowly begin to unpack them all, we begin to see an even clearer image of Jesus. And it takes time and it takes a lot of energy, and it's a long process, but we can all start that journey with someone else today. I'm sure if you think of people in your life who you might have walked this Christian journey with them for a little bit, or maybe for a long time, or maybe not at all, you have the opportunity to begin to unpack these eyewitness accounts, these historically documented um, files, you could say, which was so important. People wrote them down again and again and again. And eventually, a few hundred years later, they said, we have to put this into a safe, but also give everybody the keys to unlock it again. What we need to do is change how we talk about our faith, but not the faith itself. Because I believe the faith that we have is so special. It's amazing because it is life-changing. And I've heard many comments that we need to avoid watering down our faith for the next generation, which I completely agree. But changing how we talk about our faith doesn't change the faith itself. But it gives the generations growing up now, the generations where in the next five or ten years will be the leaders of our communities, it gives those generations and the generations to come something to hold on to. Something for them that is real. Something for them that is powerful. Something for them that they can look to and say, yeah, these guys believed it so much, what they're saying must have some kind of weight. That they loved it so much, they gave their lives for it. So if we go to the next slide, I want to finish on this. To lift up Jesus first, we need to tell his story. And then as we tell his story, that event that sparked the movement, that brought us the Bible, we also get to share how that has impacted our story. Because when we do that, that really helps us show who Christ is to a generation that has currently seemingly just decided that they don't want anything to do with him anymore. But I do genuinely believe that Christ's message will continue on and that everybody will have an opportunity to actually see who Christ is like, what Christ is like, the character, the love that he has. I genuinely believe that everybody will have an opportunity to see that in some way, shape, or form. And we get to be part of it. We are the ones who are called to share his story, 
to lift Jesus up and then share how Jesus has impacted our story. Our final song for today is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I think that's something that we need to do every day because the more we focus on Jesus, the more we see his story. And then that impacts our story. And then you can impact their story. May God bless you today. finish. Loving Father, help us to turn our eyes to you, to see you, to see the one who came and lived and died for us, that we will have that opportunity to take that and really see how much you care and also share that care and love with others. May you bless everybody today as we depart this building and that we will carry you with us wherever we go that your love will be an example to others so that they can see you and also be drawn to how amazing you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.